Good morning, and welcome this Easter morning. We are all pleased that you could come and gather together with us today to worship the Lord. And it's a great day of remembrance for what Christ has done for everyone. Um, not very many announcements today. There's no Bible study this evening. We set that time aside so you can enjoy the day with your family this evening. And the um, food pantry needs are in the insert in your bulletins today. Are there any other announcements or praises or prayer requests or anything? All right. He is risen. <laughs> Let's stand and sing number 256. Number 256. turn over to 262 he lives number 262 I 
Okay, now stay with me. <laughs> In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing. with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, so Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. The other is so loving, so good. Thank you. 
Thank you so much to everybody who participated in the choir. You guys sounded great. Yeah, thank you guys. And that was a, a joy to hear. And thank you to, to Steve and Jen for organizing that. And um, Yeah, just re very appreciative of that. And a great way to uh, just celebrate the risen Lord on this Easter morning. Now, if you'd like to turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 28, that's where we'll be today. And we'll be looking at that passage. And I would like to wish everybody here a happy Easter. And uh, again, just so thankful that we're able to, to celebrate this day and a beautiful day. And uh, just the, that we have a, a Lord who rose and who lives today. Matthew chapter 28, we'll be looking at the whole passage. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back a stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests, all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole them away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you for your Son who came into our world, lived a perfect life, died an unjust death as a sinless man, and rose on the third day so that all who believe in him can have eternal life. That is the promise of the gospel, that is the hope of the world, that is the truth in which we believe. And on this Easter, we rejoice in that. Lord, we pray for this church as we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead. We rejoice that there is hope in a fallen world. We rejoice that there is your offer of grace and forgiveness. Lord, we are imperfect people. We sin. We go our own way. But on Easter, may we rem remember the love that you have for us. That God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Lord, we pray for our time today as we study your word. For all of us, Lord, I pray that we can be pointed to the truth of the gospel and the risen Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the most important event in human history bar none. To quote the late historian Yaroslav Pelikan, if Christ is risen, nothing else matters. And if Christ is not risen, nothing else matters. 
There is no middle ground with the resurrection. A risen Christ proves the gospel, proves that Jesus is who he says he is. A risen Christ must be listened to. A risen Christ has authority. A risen Christ validates his teachings and his ministry. If Christ is not risen, none of that would be true. If Christ is not risen, then there's no point to any of this. There's no middle ground. With a risen Christ, there is only one appropriate response. To fall before him as Lord and Savior and to live your life for him and for his glory. If Christ is not risen, he's just some guy. To borrow from C.S. Lewis, Jesus was either Lord, a lunatic, or a liar. Either he is who he said he is, or he's a madman, or he's a con man. But he cannot be a good man, but not God. That is what's impossible. There's a lot of gray area in the world, but the gospel is black and white. Jesus rose from the dead, or he did not. And you believe that, or you do not. There's no middle ground. You believe that Jesus is the savior of the world who died and rose, or you don't. That is the basis for your hope, or it's not. The world loves to make its own gospel, loves to try to make its own system of how we can earn forgiveness, how we can be good enough, loves to have that sense of control. But the gospel shows that we are not in control. Yet, it also gives us the hope and grace and points us to life because we have a Savior who died and rose to life. For many, the gospel is a stumbling block. To others, it's offensive. But to those who believe in the gospel, it's the power of God. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. What we're doing today is looking at Matthew's gospel and the account of the resurrection and trying to answer the questions of why we should believe in the resurrection and how we should respond to the resurrection. And with that, we'll jump into our passage and go over this text. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 1, says, Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the, see the tomb. It's the first Easter morning. Matthew mentions that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. All four Gospels tell us that Mary Magdalene was in this group that discovered the empty tomb. That in itself is remarkable. In the first century, women were not looked upon especially favorably in this culture. Women could not give admissible testimony in court. Yet all four Gospels record that it was women who had first discovered the empty tomb. There's only one reason why that makes sense. Because those are the people who discovered the empty tomb. You wouldn't make up a story like that. If you had made up the story, you would have said it was Peter or John or James who discovered the empty tomb. But the Gospels say it was a group of women. Mary Magdalene, outside of her appearances at the cross and with the empty tomb only appears one other place in any of the Gospels. She's not a major figure, aside from being a witness to the risen Christ. But really, that should be what marks all of our lives. What gives all of our lives meaning and notoriety is knowing Christ himself. Matthew mentions Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Mark mentions Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. Luke 24.10 says, Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women were with them. John mentions only Mary Magdalene. Some, some skeptics point to this and go, see, the stories are different. 
None of the gospel writers says that they're giving an exhaustive list. Luke, in fact, says, and the other women, acknowledging that he's leaving names out. But they all agree that Mary Magdalene was at the empty tomb. They all agree that women discovered the empty tomb. And they all agree that the main point was that the tomb was empty because Jesus had risen from the dead. Verse 2, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. The scene shifts quickly to a dramatic moment. Verse 2, where it says, Behold. That's a word I think can be easy to overlook in English. In English, behold is a verb. In Greek, the word behold is an interjection. If you remember from the Schoolhouse Rock videos, Interjections are words that show excitement or emotion. Words like, yay, aha, whoa, or shh. So, really, I think it's easy to just kind of pass right through what it's saying. Behold, they found. It's more like, look and behold. There was a great earthquake. Why was there a great earthquake? For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. That is the reason why there is a great earthquake. An angel descends, rolls back the stone. That causes the earth to quake. The text mentions that the angel's appearance was like lightning. An awesome sight to behold. The guards are terrified by this. We would be too. Matthew mentions out of fear that they trembled and became like dead men. Ironic when we consider that it's a story about a dead man who's been raised to life. Verse 5, But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. That is the greatest message humanity has ever heard. They're going to the tomb to see the body of their beloved Jesus. And instead the angel tells them, He is not here, for he is risen. The angel continues to give them instructions. Verse 7, Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, there's that word again, He is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. I have told you. The women who discover the empty tomb are chosen to be the first to herald the message that Jesus is risen from the dead. They're in Jerusalem, but the angel tells the women to tell the disciples to go to Galilee where they will see Jesus. That was something that Jesus had told the disciples during his earthly ministry before he was arrested by the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin in Matthew chapter 26, verse 32, he's talking to his disciples and says, after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And so they're being reminded of this. Verse 8. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Consider the scene for a moment. They're on the way to tell the greatest news in history. This teacher, whom they loved, had been brutally executed. Verse 9, and behold, again, I think that word is six or seven times in this passage. Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. They had heard, but now they see the risen Lord, the drama of the situation, the most dramatic and powerful moment in human history. Jesus appears to them and says, greetings. That's a pretty common introduction in the Greek language at this time, almost informal, almost like he's just saying, hey, 
But really, what else needs to be said? They are witnessing the risen Christ. The women come up to Jesus and take hold of his feet and worship him. They've heard him and seen him, but here they touch Jesus. And that matters because this is not some spiritual vision. He's in the flesh. Jesus has had a physical, bodily resurrection from the dead. Verse 10, the risen Lord speaks again. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And telling them not to be afraid, we had seen the fear of the guards when they saw the angel. We see other theophanies in the Bible. People are terrified. Isaiah and John both give visions of the throne room of heaven. It's a frightening sight to behold God's glory. And so Jesus calms any fears that they might have. And then he commands them again to do what the angel has already instructed them to do. To tell the disciples and to go to Galilee where they will see Jesus. Now the scene changes in verse 11. Matthew introduces a controversy into the story. He introduces an alternative theory that was being spread. We've just seen the risen Jesus. Verses 11 to 15 are a conspiracy theory that the tomb was robbed by the disciples. And Matthew mentions that in his own gospel. And he also mentions that that was a story that had been continued to be circulated. Verses 11 to 15. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. So they hear about the empty tomb. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed, and that story has been spread among the Jews to this day. So this alternative explanation that the tomb had been robbed. That's truly fascinating when you think about it, that the Gospel of Matthew would include a plausible explanation. But one thing about that theory that's also significant is that it still forces you to acknowledge the empty tomb. You would not have invented the idea of Christianity. No one would have. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about the witnesses to the resurrection, beginning in verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the, in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Paul is saying that there are witnesses to the risen Christ. There are people walking around who have seen the risen Jesus. Atheists and skeptics like to paint Christianity like it's some mythological religion. But its foundational is event is something that we believe to be a real event which happened at a real point in history. That on the first Easter, a dead man was resurrected. We have four Gospels written early, probably around the 80, 60s to 70s of the first century, spreading the story that Jesus had risen from the dead. You have Paul's writings, which actually are written before the Gospels were written. The Gospels come from oral tradition. The story was told, then it was written. Paul wrote before the Gospels were written. He references Jesus being raised from the dead. Philippians chapter 2, Paul makes reference to the crucifixion. 
And it's a passage that most New Testament scholars think was actually some sort of early confessional or creedal statement in the early church, which predates even Paul. Some scholars think that potentially dates to within just a few years of Jesus' death and resurrection. Philippians chapter 2, the end of verse 5 through 11. Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And again, there are witnesses. And there are early historians in the first and early second centuries talking about the influence of Christianity. It's indisputable that there was an early Jesus movement in the first century. But why? Skeptics sometimes will point out that there were lots of people in the first century who claimed to be the Christ. Some were even crucified. That's true. But nobody ever worshipped them. Why? Because none of them rose from the dead. But that gets to an important point, and it's what I said a moment ago. You would not have invented the story of the resurrection. We often look to people of bygone eras as being so much simpler and less sophisticated and less intelligent than we are today. We have almost 2,000 years of history of this story of the resurrection. For us, if we believe it or if we don't believe it, the idea is familiar. In the first century, it was not. And I would actually argue that the resurrection would have been harder not easier to believe in the first century than it is today. And I say that because I consider the dominant religious views of the first century. And I borrow from Tim Keller in his book, The Reason for God. Resurrection would have been unthinkable in Greco-Roman society. It wouldn't have even been desirable in their worldview. In the philosophical Greek and Roman view, the body was corrupted, the soul was good. In death, the soul was freed from the body. That worldview does not have interest in a resurrection, in a bodily resurrection. Why would you want to stay in your sinful body? Some religions believe in the idea of reincarnation. That view is also incompatible with the idea of resurrection because the whole point of reincarnation is you're being reincarnated into a different body depending on how you lived your life. Even within Judaism, the idea of a resurrection was not universal. The Sanhedrin, the ruling council who had Jesus killed, was overwhelmingly made up of people who were in a group called the Sadducees. Theologically, the Sadducees did not believe in a bodily resurrection. And even for those Jews who did, the belief was that the resurrection would happen at the end of time. It's one thing to believe in some sort of future and distant hope of a resurrection. It's another thing to believe that Today, someone just died a couple days ago and rose from the dead. But there you have Jesus, and you have witnesses, and you have a new religion that starts and rapidly grows. They have no political influence. In fact, what they believe is illegal. Jews had been facing increasing persecution in the Roman Empire, and Christians were looked at as being this sort of weird, cultic subset of Judaism. They had no power, no worldly power at least, and yet the movement grew rapidly. There was no financial benefit. 
Today we see televangelists who live in mansions and wear suits that cost more than what most of us probably spend on our wardrobes in the course of a year, who drive expensive cars. It wasn't like that in the first century. There was no financial incentive in an unpopular religion, in an overwhelmingly impoverished area. They had no military power, yet the movement grew. Persecution in Rome continued to get more and more oppressive on the church, yet within a couple of centuries, it became the dominant religion in Rome. How? Why? Because it was true. Skeptics like to explain different ways to try to explain Easter. Matthew gives one of those common suggestions in this passage. Well, maybe the disciples took the body. Why? So they could be persecuted and live lives of hardship? Most of the disciples were martyred. To borrow from Josh McDowell, no one dies for a lie. Why would you sign up to live a life of persecution and hardship and ultimately go to your death saying that you had seen the risen Christ unless what you were actually saying was true? The late Charles Colson was an attorney and legal counsel for President Richard Nixon. He later founded Prison Fellowship and popular radio ministries like Breakpoint. But in the 1970s, in the aftermath of the Watergate scandal, facing prison time. With all of that going on, Charles Colson became a Christian. He would eventually take a plea for obstruction of justice and serve time in prison for his involvement in Watergate. I love this quote from Colson. I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it wasn't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. In another place, Colson says... Men will give their lives for something that they believe to be true. They will never give their lives for something they know to be false. Another alternative theory. Maybe they went to the wrong tomb. Maybe Mary and the rest of the women just got it wrong. Had that happened, someone would have just gone to the right tomb and presented the body. Maybe the story was exaggerated or later on revised. That's something that skeptics argue, that maybe the story just got twisted over time. Maybe the disciples really missed Jesus so much that someone had a dream about him and saw him in a vision, and that got misreported, and that's how it all started. That doesn't explain all of the witnesses to the risen Christ. It also doesn't explain the expansion of the early Christian movement. A story that was exaggerated, suddenly hundreds and then thousands and then tens of thousands of people in Rome believing something that is totally against their culture and worldview. A new worldview and value system organically started on its own overnight. Ideas of grace, which were not part of the Roman belief system or most what most Jewish people believed suddenly just came from nowhere and people then had this undying commitment to it out of the blue for no reason. Now, the risen Christ is obviously the greatest evidence of the resurrection. But perhaps the second greatest piece of evidence that Christ rose is the impact that he had on the first century Roman world. It turned the society upside down. Another theory that people put out. Well, what if Jesus didn't actually die on the cross? That's another suggestion. Look, the Romans knew how to do crucifixion. 
Again, they might not have known some of the things that we know today in the first century. In the first century, they could tell when somebody was dead. Jesus had been flogged. Sometimes people wouldn't even survive first century floggings. They were brutal beatings. He would have been profusely bleeding. His body would have been in shock. Vital organs shutting down. His heart rate would have increased to pump the decreased blood supply. The idea that after that horrible beating and crucifixion that someone could survive is absurd, especially without modern medicine, even then. And then to bounce right back up a couple of days later and say everything's fine? Maybe Jesus had a twin brother. Where'd the twin get the nail marks in his hands from? Jesus has other siblings who are mentioned in the Gospels. How come they didn't say, oh, he also has a twin? There's no evidence of Jesus having a twin. Well, the story was just borrowed from Egyptian myths. No, it wasn't. If you really study those myths, radically different. Also, a lot of what gets claimed to be from ancient mythology is actually stories that come after the time of Christianity. We have accounts of the time. We have the gospel witnesses. Paul and the rest of the New Testament writers, the early church, historians who talked about the impact on the early church. Also, speaking of Paul, why does Paul, of anyone else in the whole world, believe this? He was a Pharisee, a persecutor of the early church, and then he gets converted to Christianity. He claims to have a personal conversion by Christ, and then goes on to live a life dedicated as a missionary where, again, he is severely harassed and persecuted. We see more than once in the New Testament where Paul is beaten, more than once in the New Testament where Paul is imprisoned and ultimately executed. Well, a resurrection just couldn't happen. If you can believe in a God who created the universe, you can believe in a God who can raise a man from the dead. The resurrection must be seriously considered by all people. There are lots of religions in the world, and sometimes I think it can be almost discouraging. How do you know which one is right? They all say so many different things. Well, Christians believe that the central event in Christianity is a real event that happened in real human history. And it's an event for which there is real evidence. We must know what we believe about the gospel. The passage continues. Jesus appears to the disciples. Verse 16. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said... All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's like I said at the beginning, there is no middle ground. At the end of Matthew's gospel, the Great Commission is grounded in the reality of the resurrection and who Jesus is. The last words spoken by Christ in the gospel of Matthew are, Behold, again, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus promises his presence with his people. And he calls upon his church to spread his message in the world. The gospel is meant to impact your life, knowing what Jesus did for you and the life you are raised to through Christ. Matthew doesn't record the response of his apostles, of the apostles. He tells that Jesus appeared to the apostles and gives them a commission that is for them and for us. Matthew and Mark's accounts of Jesus appearing to the disciples are very brief. I believe this is intentional by the gospel writers because they're putting the onus on us 
and all other believers in the gospel to live out Jesus' words, to live out his calling, to go and make disciples, to baptize, to teach the word that Christ taught, and to do Christ's work in the world. Matthew's gospel shows us Easter, but then shows us what to do as a result of Easter. And that today remains the job of the church and of all Christians. We rejoice in the truth of the resurrection, but we also live in the light of the truth as the people of God to the glory of God, doing the work of God in his world. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, again, we rejoice that there is hope, that death is not the end, that there is forgiveness and grace. Lord, we could not earn or deserve your grace, but you give it because you were good and loving. And may we embrace that truth and have lives that are transformed by that. In Jesus' name, amen. stand and sing number 496. We'll sing the first three verses only. 496.
Please remain standing for the benediction. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Happy Easter. <laughs>